Okay. Okay. Oh, wow. Okay, it's, it's streaming live now. Yes. Okay, good. Okay. Just two more seconds. Yeah, that's all right. It's, you let me know when to trigger. Okay. Okay, good evening, folks. Welcome, welcome to Say It Loud another evening. Thanks for joining us. Remember, please click like and share as you come in and let others know that we're here. This is Eve, and um, it's our ninth episode on Say It Loud with Eve, and we have a very fascinating topic to talk about tonight. Um, I must say I was not here last week. Um, so much is happening, so much is going on, and I was so in tune, like many of you are, with the American election and all of that, you know, and I'm still, still keeping up with it, but um, I, had a, I, had a, had, I do have a lot going on, so hence my absence, but tonight, hey, we're here, we're back. I did say it would have been the final episode, but it will not be. We'll be back um, on the 26th of November again about menopause because it's such a wide topic and there are so many different perspectives to look at it from. Hence, I decided to split it in two. So we're gonna focus uh, mainly on the medical and psychological aspect when I touch on the nutritional and hormonal side a little bit as well tonight. But then on the 26th, we're gonna look at another aspect or approach in terms of management. Um, we have two very special guests tonight, and I will not uh, delay because we do have a lot to go through um, uh, in the discussion. So uh, I'm just going to crack on, all right, and ask Dr. We have Dr. Abby Oden and we have Pamela Windle, and I'm going to ask um, them to just introduce themselves to us tonight. Um, Pamela, I'll start with you. Can you just introduce? Tell us a bit about yourself, what you do, and why you're so, you know, you, I think you're a specialist when it comes to menopause. So just share a bit of information about yourself with us. Oh, hi, everybody. So I'm Pamela Windle, and I'm a certified woman's health coach and hypnotherapist as well. Um, but so I specialize in women's health particularly around the perimenopause and menopause and and I use functional nutrition to help women navigate that phase and feel healthy and optimize their their hormones along that journey as well um, so I used food as medicine and I'm always trying to find root cause so I also use diagnostic testings hormonal test which is a urine test that I use um, that looks at all of the hormones and the adrenal glands. And then I look at mineral deficiencies and vitamin deficiencies and things like that. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Abiode? Yes. Uh, good evening, everybody. Um, my name is Abiode Fakokunde. Well, most people call me Bio. I'm a consultant gynecologist and obstetrician. I work at the North Middlesex Hospital. Um, majority of my work centers around women's health, as you would know. And uh, I do... Um, but primarily, I look after women also who are going through uh, the changes. And sometimes some of the changes is also as a result of uh, the surgery that I had performed on a woman. So it's about getting everybody back to normal during that course of time. Um, yes, I've been in North Middlesex for 2000, since 2005. Uh, I look after fi most of my work is centered around fibroids, to be fair. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Doc. So I'm going to, um, you know, it's about menopause and uh, we're going to be looking at what this is. I'm sure those of you who've experienced it, you know what it is, but we're going to look at this, what it is and look at, you know, physiology, biology um, and, and different approaches. Um, you know, Pamela, you do hypnotherapy, you do CBT and things like that. 
and um, of course you mentioned the nutrition. So we're going to have a look at what this is and, and how we can be managed in terms of the symptoms, um, the, the, the causes and so on. And I, as a, as, a, as a person in the nursing or medical field as well, I, I do believe that the, the body is very fascinating and it's a complex whole. And as such, I think whatever approach we take to deal, to help deal with some of the dysfunctions that we experience in our bodies, um, it should, you know, it should be holistic. And that's just my view. Um, everything in our body is about balance. Your temperature goes up, your body tries to regulate it to get it down. You know, it goes down your body, you know, you're thirsty, you want to drink to quench yourself. So it's all about balance and harmony. And um, menopause is also for me, it's telling us that we are aging. We're getting older, women, we're getting older. And sometimes we approach aging with a bit of fear and dread. And we overlook the, the conscious processes or process of um, conscious transformation that life life entails and and the wisdom and the love that we could still embrace or even pass on as we age so all of that being said doc i'll start with you we're going to have dr abioden doing a presentation um tonight to give a, a, an overview of men of about menopause and then we'll crack on with some questions to the panel so doc whenever you're ready you can start okay okay thank you very much eve Okay, let's do Okay, I'm gonna be share. Is my my and, slide is being shared? Can I say before you start, Doc? I want to thank both Dr. Avioden and Pamela for saying yes to to join me tonight. We've never met in person. Pamela, I think I spoke with you once. I saw her on another program and I reached out to her. I was so impressed by her delivery. I uh, okay. reached out to her and she <laughs> said yes. She was she's very keen to come on. And Doc. Doc, I thank you because you almost gave me a heart attack, by the way. Don't worry, we are well, fine. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Eve, for inviting me to okay. speak here today. And um, as I said, it's a very interesting topic because oftentimes I get patients referred um, for menopausal symptoms. Okay, and uh, often about how to manage it. But the first thing is to decide what actually, let me see, no, is that one working? Yes, so what is menopause itself? The, I think majority of the time people, menopause is actually a single event. The menopause means you haven't seen your period for over 12 months, but there is a period that lags between that time to the time that the menopause itself actually does occur. From about the age of 40, most women will start having some changes that may be related to menopause. But invariably, it takes root at around the age of, between the age of 45 to about 56. Um, average age is about 51, but again, this is actually, there's a bit of ethnic variation into it. So um, black tend to go a little bit, black women tend to go later into menopause, and then I think white uh, women a bit earlier somehow. There are some areas of life that also affect how quick you go into menopause. I think uh, one life, uh, one social habit is actually smoking. The, so smokers tend to go a bit earlier. Uh, some women, for one reason or the other, they could be have what they call uh, premature menopause when it starts before the age of 40. And of course, sometimes following surgery, menopause could actually be in create, I mean, queen D's because you take the old results during the course of the management or sometimes for people who are having chemotherapy for other things. So it could knock the ovary out and then became, I mean, become um, uh, 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 non-functional. Um, natural, well, I use the word end of natural reproductive life because life has moved on from the time when we were younger when once you reach menopause, you can't have a baby anymore. Now, technically speaking, you can have baby even after menopause, but again, not with your own eggs, but other things. So we'll probably discuss that uh, during the question and answer. The main reason why menopause has seemed to occur is essentially to do with the fact that the ovaries, which produce estrogens that give women what women is, are in terms of uh, uh, that uh, uh, menstrual period, actually 
stop being produced or being produced in a very, very low uh, rate that it makes it difficult for the cycle that happens, which leads to regeneration of the lining of the womb on a monthly basis become a bit more pronounced. Majority will have the symptoms about all uh, uh, the way you people accept menopause is almost uh, it's almost uh, also cultural. In some cultures, being menopausal is a sign of being accepted into the senior guest group. So people value you more and people, you actually have more role in the community. In some African communities, that's when you can become members of certain societies. So women actually feel more entitled at menopause because they are senior girls then. Uh, and so, but again, nowadays with the, 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 the system, with the way things are going, in different parts of the world, it's a lot of women are actually working in the in the workplace, and the menopause can be a very big distraction during the menopausal years. Considering the fact that majority will be at the peak of careers around 45 to about 55, and those are the time that you are extending these uh, changes in your body system, which can be quite disturbing, really. Um, <clears throat> significant proportion will experience symptoms. Okay. And uh, it may linger on till after the last period, but oftentimes, actually, it goes back. It goes back to normal on its own for most people, but some people it could carry on forever. I think I've seen a woman who's been on HRT to the age of 65, 66, and she was quite scared of stopping the HRT because of the changes. Now, this is what happens. What happens? Most of the eggs women use have been you know, to uh, the ovaries produce actually has been formed long before once is born. So you have your best count just before you are born. I mean, from the about eight weeks of life actually inside mother's womb. Then that number keeps on dwindling till you one reaches menopause. So if you look at this, um, that, and that's, a, that's the uh, follicle numbers. The follicles are what produce the um, hormones that actually stimulate uh, the menstrual cycle. And that's at puberty when most women are most fertile is between 25 and 35. Then as uh, from 35 downwards or 37 downwards, depending on which school of thought you belong to, the fertility start dwindling. Then by 50, the ovarian reserve is literally zero at that time. Okay. <clears throat> and of course, you see the changes, the premenopause, premenopause, regular and consistent, and the perimenopause, what you start noticing is that the period becomes a little bit erratic, okay? Then at menopause, it becomes, you know, there's, a, there's no, there's no, the oh, estrogen level is actually become very, very low. And postmenopause, it's very low altogether. So these are the changes that happen. It's all to do with the level of estrogen in the system. So the estrogen is the, is the main hormones that people lack that actually leads to menopause, okay? What are the symptoms with people experience? Now it's a head to toe kind of problems in the sense that it can affect every part of the body. A lot of the time, of course, is a bit also uh, understanding what is going on with people in terms of the system. We generally classify it into three broad groups. We call the vessel motor symptoms, and then the, also the uh, mood changes and also the uh, lower urinary tract syndromes. So those are the three parts, actually. A lot of it, again, is got to do with the odd flushes. Uh, you have skin dryness, night sweats. I think most troublesome is usually the odd, for odd flushes and night sweats. Uh, irregular heartbeat is not necessarily because of menopause. It's just because people are just anxious around that time. Breast tenderness could occur. Occasional digestive symptoms could actually be there, but not necessarily because of menopause again. But again, along it is a loss of libido. The sexual drive is actually not there for most women around that time. Sex becomes quite painful because of vaginal dryness. Um, the menstrual period problem could actually occur around the perimenopause in the sense that you don't see your period for two to three months, and then all of a sudden it comes and it lingers on for about four, five, six, seven, eight days sometimes and it could be heavy. Um, when you come to the bladder, there's a frequent wanting to go to the toilet. And then sometimes you can have, you have a bit of a dysuria, which in which case they can start treating people for a uh, urinary tract infection. Again, fatigue, you feel tired, listless, a little bit of depression, a little bit of mood swings. And then because people are not sleeping well, so sleep disorders, you know, with sleep disorders, then you have all the mood changes that occur the next day. 
Then most importantly, for those of us who are that age now, memory lapses. I can't remember what I did yesterday. I can't remember what's going on. So it's pretty common around perimenopause. But the good news is that it's actually things get better with time. Okay. Um, as I said, women's relationship with menopause is pretty complicated. Quite a few, we what can be a struggle because of what is going on. I think I spoke to a lady just this evening and I was talking to her. She wants to go back to work, but she doesn't feel right in herself because she's going through the change and uh, she can't sleep well. And so she's, and she's a, a high powered uh, receptionist in the city. So she was kind of uh, struggle with that. Uh, sex is a very big issue for a lot of uh, when, when people are this age. And oftentimes, um, men don't go to andropos or whatever we call it until a bit <laughs> much later. So uh, man, the man is, uh, is being driven, the woman is not there. So it can cause a bit of a family rift mm -hmm. around the same time. So it's you, probably a discussion around it will be quite useful. Um, social life, it can be affected again because you don't feel comfortable. A lot of body image issues actually does occur at this time. I'm getting fatter. I can't fit into my dress. It's a very common discussion. And then you don't want to join your friends in all, you know, in their so in the other social life. Um, for, uh, men tend to be a little bit, uh, find it difficult because they can't understand what is going on sometimes. And so they struggle with their relationship and they can't understand why my wife doesn't want sex again. I can't understand why she's always snappy. So it's all those kind of things to change can affect the uh, quality in the house. Um, <clears throat> I've discussed the issue of work, embarrassed, unable to disclose menopausal symptoms. Well, probably this is one of the very few times when men and women can stay in the same office with the AC on. Because generally, <laughs> <laughs> so because usually women feel colder, but during perimenopause or menopause, they feel a bit warmer. So yeah. maybe it's a kind of uh, things. But so most workplaces nowadays actually have a kind of a support system for women going through menopause. I think most hospitals, uh, occupational health could actually help with it. Um, <clears throat> I'm gonna go straight to what I can discuss a bit better uh, freely, which is the use of, with treatment of menopause. I think Pamela will come in and mention, discuss other aspects of uh, the non-drug uh, treatment. I will probably focus on the ones that I am a little bit more uh, comfortable with, okay? <laughs> okay. Um, homo replacement therapy. I think if there's anything that has happened in medicine in the last 40 years mm -hmm. is actually HRT. Um, in the 80s, before 80s, we didn't have anything. Mm -hmm. Then all of a sudden, between 80 and 90, mid 90s, HRT came on board. Unfortunately, with everything we do, we always abuse it sometimes. So there was a lot of abuse of HRT as well. I mean, I, I think my first clinic when I came to the UK was a, I used to run a menopause clinic, in which case we put estrogen and testosterone implants on a, every six months for women. So it was something that we invariably find that it was counterproductive. And of yeah. course, with everything like this, yeah, you, what happens is that you start getting reports that actually identify the, the side effects. And then there was a lot of panic. So you will hear about 1 million women studies and about the impact on breast cancer, which I will mention briefly towards the end. Yeah. Um, a lot of people don't need HRT, but those who have severe menopausal symptoms, there's no reason why they should suffer in silence. It's actually very useful to actually replace what people are losing. The main things that is useful for mood changes can be quite better. The lower urinary tract syndrome of dysuria, going to the toilet at night frequently, wanting to pee all the time, loss of libido, heart flushes, and also more important, risk of osteoporosis uh, for a fracture because the bone mass becomes small mm. once a woman reaches menopause, okay? <clears throat> uh, how do we deliver HRT? We deliver it in different format, tablet, skin patches, gel to rub into the skin, implants I mentioned earlier. The tablet and the um, tablet is quite popular, but of course uh, the skin patches is also much more is becoming a bit more possible, uh, more available as well. Um, these are the tablets that we have. Now, you would have heard of recent that there are some HRT that are not available. So sometimes you might have to be, uh, play around to find the one that is available. The, the production is a bit reduced of recent. Patches and gel is quite nice. Patches is very useful. 
Now that the ear is the coil, the hormonal coil, sometimes some people, because of the effect of progesterone on the breast, they actually could use this hormonal coil. If you give HRT for a woman who has got uterus, you must balance it. Okay, you have to balance estrogen with progesterone. Otherwise, the woman will develop endometrial cancer. Mm -hmm. Okay, so if you don't want to use the progesterone, because progesterone actually causes breast uh, congestion, it's also caused some tiny cysts in the breast and for some women, then it becomes a little bit advisable to just put in a marina coil or any of the hormone secreting coil and then use estrogen as a tablet or as a patches and all sort of other method. Testosterone gel is pretty popular somehow for one reason or the other to improve libido. So quite a, you, I do get occasional women asking me, can I, be, can I use a testosterone gel or testosterone gel? Okay. Um, patches you use every two weeks or so, I mean, twice a week, depending on the dosage, you start with the lower dose and then you graduate till you actually titrate to the level that is safe for the women. Uh, what are the side effects? Of course, most things we use is not without side effects. Headaches is uh, quite popular. I did have somebody who said I can't use it because of headache, because of my migraine. Vagina bleeding can occur because we don't use the non-bleeding HRT until after 12 months of, um, of, uh, of using the bleeding time. So you usually start the bleeding time around the perimenopause. Then once a woman reaches menopause, you give her about 12 months after, then you can convert to the non-bleeding HRT. But even then, you could still have it a little bit there. Some people will still bleed and have a bit of a withdrawal bleeding. Blood clot is not particularly as common. Breast cancer is something that I will probably highlight a little bit. It's, a, it's one of those things, calling a dog a bad name to hang it. It doesn't cause the, if you look at the proportion of women that actually develop, let me see, I think I have it here. I'll come back to some of this thing. Okay. If you look at this, this is the number of women who will have breast cancer in a population. If a woman uses HRT, you increase that number by four. Okay. If the woman, <clears throat> sorry, if the woman uses a estrogen only HRT, which you can use if a woman has had hysterectomy, that yeah. is the womb has been taken out, you can actually use estrogen alone without the progesterone. That actually, those women actually have less incidence of breast cancer, okay? Mm -hmm. And then if the woman uses, the, a woman who's, who's used a combined oral contraceptive pill in the past, actually has a, the same rate of uh, breast cancer with HRT. So I think it was overflogged at the beginning mm -hmm. about how HRT causes breast cancer. Okay, so that's, uh, that's something to remember. Mm -hmm. uh, heart disease, usually women have their, they have what they call cardioprotection because of estrogen. Yeah. However, once they, go in, once they go into menopause, their odds of developing heart disease is, as, is the same as men. Men are at increased risk of heart disease. So, mm -hmm. uh, but if you start HRT for women before the age of 60, apparently, uh, <clears throat> A bit, only six, six, within six years of being menopausal, you actually put, you carry on with that protection in the, in the heart situation compared to women who don't use HRT. Um, heart flushes without hormones. I think I will leave that to Pamela because a lot of these things will probably come within Pamela's remit, cognitive behavioral therapy, yeah. structural attention and all those things. But a lot of them, I wouldn't say, I can't say much about it. I do send women to Holland and Barrett sometimes when I've exhausted what I have. <laughs> um, if, you, if people can't use hormones, because some people with breast cancer, with sensitive hormone, breast cancer, sense, uh, hormone sensitive breast cancers, they can't use HRT. And these are very difficult situations to actually treat. So you could give some anti, anti, um, antidepressants because um, paroxetine and fenfloxine are all antidepressants. They can improve the mood changes. Clonidine is quite useful for vasomotor symptoms in some such women, but you actually, you, you titrate the dose again from small to, to the highest. Um, again, I will leave this to Pamela to explain a, claim a bit more. Exercise, yoga, improving your quality of life. As I said to you, I do send patients to Holland and Barrett mm -hmm. and then also to psychotherapists. And then, because a lot of these things also about accepting that yeah. stage of life as something that is not permanent, but it's something that we get better over time, okay? Uh, testosterone replacement. 
Now, testosterone replacement is uh, one of those things that it would be unfair to talk about menopause without talking about it, because in the sense that it does help in those who it, who it will benefit. But a lot of people will actually do well going on HRT on its own without having to give testosterone. But I've seen people who actually want to have testosterone. Implants is not particularly the way there are some nice way of delivering it of recent, which is the, the gel. It works quite well. Um, <clears throat> It's worse if, it's, if, the, if the menopause is induced surgically because you take the, uh, the ovaries itself still produce some mild testosterone even in menopausal state. But if you've removed it, then it's, uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't help at all. Uh, libido, sexual arousal, orgasm, it, it, that's the way it works, just the same way it works for men. Um, people have also discussed about use of Viagra actually, which is also very say, useful in such situation. So I will stop here probably now to allow some discussion and then to listen to Pamela uh, about what menopause is and uh, how it affects our women. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Doc. Thank you so, so much. Pamela? Hi. Your feedback seemed to be highly anticipated. <laughs> <laughs> But yes, but that was very informative, Doc. Thank you. And I'm just um, you. You mentioned um, you mentioned about the the, pre, the surgical um, surgical induced menopause. Yes. This. What about? And I'm going to just jump in before Pamela comes in, or should I just or Pamela? Let me go to you first before I'm just keen to get in there. But what have been your experience in terms of? women that you've seen in terms of the symptoms that they're experiencing and um, what kind of, just tell us about your approach, the approach that you take. Okay, so let's talk about libido. So I have women that come see me who feel that their libido is waning and they're in a relationship, they're in a marriage that they're happy with. So there's nothing physically wrong with the marriage, but somehow yeah. they feel as if it's just changed slightly. And so when I do the tests, the Dutch tests, we look at the hormones and ideally would say, OK, it's your testosterone levels are low. However, when I test their hormones using the Dutch test, it looks at metabolites as well and also looks at adrenal health. Often it's not the testosterone, it's the adrenal gland. So this woman is just completely exhausted. She doesn't have enough energy to muster up any motivation to have intercourse with her husband. Okay, so it's it's not just simply testosterone. But she uh, testosterone is good because she exercised. So if you build muscle, that also helps to maintain your testosterone levels. Mm -hmm. And if you reduce your alcohol intake as well, because alcohol actually depletes testosterone as well. Yeah. So that's that's what I would do in terms of a woman that comes to see me. I wouldn't just say her symptoms are the actual problem i always look for what the root cause is okay, that's fair enough yeah um of course a lot of um uh, hormonal dysfunction occurs around 40s ir irrespective of whether you're a man or a woman so majority is uh, routinely i mean i don't check for the adrenal function at all because unless they've got some specific symptoms i'm not particularly familiar with the test but it's great to actually have a urine test that you can is a urine test isn't it it is a and, urine uh, that's a very good one i i'll probably discuss it at work again yeah, and see. what exactly yeah, what, yeah. what what are you what parameters are you testing for what do you look for so you look at testosterone with the dutch test you say dutch do you the Dutch test. Yeah. yeah, so it's a dry urine a test, a hormonal test that okay. so men, man version, a female version, yeah. and okay. so it looks at it looks at the whole of the HPA axis. So it's looking at your adrenal glands uh -huh. and the ovaries and okay. production progesterone, estrogen, testosterone, okay. but also the metabolites okay. and it's that liver health. Um, so detoxification of estrogen in particular. Okay. So okay. it's not you're not at risk of developing an estrogen driven cancer like oh, breast okay. cancer. So okay. you can, I can see whether someone is heading down that way. Mm -hmm. And then it also looks at melatonin and then cortisol and cortisone okay. and then other things as well. So it's really comprehensive. But you know, when we talk about HRT, um, oh. you know, I've had clients that have come to see me post menopausal women when they've come to see me and they have tried HRT, but for some reason they decided not to come, go on it because a family members had an Eastern driven cancer, you know, mm -hmm. maybe one or two family members. Yeah. 
And actually, when we've done the Dutch test and we've looked at the hormones, yes, her estrogen levels are very low, almost depleted, really. And oh, this woman oh. perhaps do with HRT. But then when we look at her metabolites, she's not doing that well. And so actually, she would be at risk of developing an estrogen dominant cancer uh, or estrogen driven cancer. And not only that, because it's already in her family. So that's what I do is kind of looking at women sort of holistically, Holistic. looking at yeah. gut health and looking at liver health as well. Yeah. I mean, on the issue of the breast cancer, nowadays, if there's a strong family history of breast cancer, mm -hmm. I don't even, we don't, we are advised not to give them HRT unless they've done their BRCA gene. You see, you can do the BRCA gene uh, one and two. If they are not, if they haven't got the familiar disposition, if you might have a family history, but if you do your BRCA gene and you don't carry that particular gene, then I will advise. But it's always very, very complex uh, discussion. Our, not only breast cancer, actually, colon cancer is something to remember as well, because they tend to kind of, the three cancers to come together, endo uh, early endometrial cancer in some of their relatives, colon cancer and breast cancer. All these uh, cancer have a bit of a genetic uh, and a hormonal predisposition. Yeah. So sometimes you, I, if a woman comes and say, oh, I've got this, I've got that, then I always, because there is a screening program that goes on in some of the local teaching hospitals as a part of a research, in which case, or you can actually check it up in central London and um, look for your, whether you are BRCA gene positive or not. And in that case, then you may be able to use HRT or not. But yeah. there's a lot of anxiety around breast cancer, especially with those with strong family history. Yeah. Yeah. Now, can we assume that menopause is in a, not assume, in, is, I'm just going to say, can we assume it's inevitable for all women? Oh, yes. Okay. Yeah, yes. You can't get Every, because the, as, as I said, everybody's, you got uh, everything that you have that you exhaust, you can, you will exhaust. Most, yes. uh, it's going to, you need, uh, uh, oh, uh, the, the ovaries will not work forever. Mm -hmm. However, we try. So yeah. once it's uh, finished with its follicles, mm -hmm. then menopause will set in because yeah. it doesn't produce that marvelous hormone, estrogen, that makes uh, things change. Mm -hmm. and, and one of the things you, you mentioned already, Doc, is that postmenopausally, because I was going to ask the question, you mm -hmm. know, just to put it out there as well, um, we, have, we hear about women having having children in their 60s and 70s or even being surrogates yes and it's a marvel how does this happen and you know people don't know the physiology behind that or you know and um, what you did mention that postmenopausally mm. they can become pregnant because there's still a bit of bleeding happening no what happens in most postmenopausal bleeding i mean by pregnancy uh technology has changed has moved things forward a lot a lot of this, a lot of what you need to get pregnant, you need eggs, mm. you need a, 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 a womb. So mm. what happens is that as long as you get good quality eggs, the womb can be prepared to become the bed that it was before. Yeah. So what people do is they actually use a lot of these pregnancies are actually donor eggs pregnancy. Mm -hmm. So eggs are given from younger couple, younger women, and then they are fertilized outside and yeah. they are put in the womb. As long as a woman has a womb, she can still carry a baby if the womb's uh, lining of the womb is okay. Yeah. So it's like somebody borrowing somebody, it's like somebody borrowing somebody's bed, yeah. technically speaking. Yeah, that's what it is. Yes. Um, Pamela, can you tell us a bit more of the, uh, I, I, I'm keen to hear about the psychological approach that you take. You do hypnotherapy, um, and, and I think you mentioned, well, CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy. What, else, what, what kind of psychological approach do you take? How do you help women manage? What advice do you give in these instances? Yeah, so when it comes to anxiety and depression, there's, there is a clear um, link between the drop in estrogen that can just basically means we don't make serotonin that well. But... Um, you know, I'm kind of looking at other things. So I'd be asking her to have her thyroid checked out, make sure that's not also 
compounding the issue also b12 as well making sure that that's not deficient so we're looking at all the other things that actually could compound her in this phase of life not just the withdrawal of the hormones um and so then I work on the gut because the gut also actually makes serotonin. I think 80% of serotonin is in the gut. And so I would actually support her gut health, making sure that she has, you know, plenty of beneficial bacteria there so that she's able to make those neurotransmitters herself. Mm -hmm. So if that's a problem, that's what we sort out. But then also, you know, from a practical point of view, things like mindfulness, meditation, um, like you mentioned, CBT also mm -hmm. works. And anything that's stressing her, you know, it's about calming the body down, making sure that she feels balanced. You know, and right now we're in a pandemic. So right now, I'm sure a lot of women in this phase of life are perhaps struggling to manage things, but it's about taking one thing at a time and managing that one thing and asking for help. You know, ask your family members, people that are close to you for some help in this phase as well yeah thank you thank you very much for that and diet dietary wise what what um, can you zero in on some of the advice you give around diet and exercise exercise yeah, I mean, psychology psychological as well but yeah i mean exercise is brilliant it does lift your your yeah. mood you know those natural endorphins are raised when we do exercise however some women struggle with fatigue in this yeah. phase of life so it's about finding that exercise that's right for you so if for example if you're going to go and do a spin class or you're going to go running and the next day you've got no energy then that's not right for you regardless of what people say that's not right for you or if you're struggling to sleep at night the next day and you feel really fatigued that's mm -hmm. not right so maybe some like yoga would be good uh pilates or some tai chi something like that or even just walking but yeah. also the practical thing about exposing your eyes to daylight you know getting outside and actually exposing your eyes to a natural daylight just an hour a day will really help and you know also just being sort of mindful you can do mindfulness have a shower you know there's all of those things helps and if you believe in God as well and you pray and that's also going to help as well mm -hmm. um nutritionally that's what you asked me wasn't you I've gone yeah. off. <laughs> no 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 you haven't gone off but <laughs> you, can you can still go there nutritionally then I would I would recommend foods that are rich in you know sort of B vitamins so all of your um meats obviously is rich in in your B vitamins as well and magnesium which it helps to calm calm the body down as well so all vitamin B's and then magnesium as well I would absolutely recommend those type of foods as well yes yeah, so on, on issue of food as well what is your take on using on the idea of um phytoestrogens yeah. because one of the reasons most people give for black uh, being um, able to maintain is uh, because of the uh, kind of the food we eat as well the soya i mean soybeans uh, things like yams they tend to contain some phytoestrogens which actually helps with menopause i must confess um, the experience of menopause i've had in the, uh, here in the uk is much more different for the, to what i had when i was back in nigeria practicing in in, uh, uh, in the same uh, in the population i think there is uh, and maybe because self education people mm -hmm. don't come out to say this is what is happening yeah. but generally speaking i think there are a lot of things that happen in the local community that women share because I think is sometimes sharing stories actually does help because mm -hmm. if you know you're not the only one going through it of the same, I mean, we always laugh on the label word. Sometimes we say, oh, what's happening there? Oh God, he's going through that stage of life. Yeah. You just start <laughs> chat about it. And yeah. the fact that you are not alone and everybody can identify with you does help as well. But a lot of the time it's because people it, it, it depends on what your life has been before you get to that stage. Mm -hmm. So it's a bit of a time of reflection. And a lot mm -hmm. of people actually uh, get a bit of uh, panic, especially uh, children also is another issue that mm -hmm. becomes a bit problematic at that time. 
because mm -hmm. you're getting about uh, youth and then they're in school then and there's this loss of self image that's a lot of where uh, you like uh, it needs a little bit more of discussion with people that it's not the end of the world you are still the same person you were just before that time and uh, people panic they come to your they come to your clinic and say, I'm getting fat. In fact, getting fat is a lot, is a big discussion. It's like it's almost it's so worrisome. And you and then you I did ask uh, I tell people that give yourself another two to three years. The middle age spread is part of the disposition. That's what uh, Pamela was talking about, the adenocorticoids. There is a middle age spread, whether we like it or not, it's yeah. part of federal middle age spread. But people come back to normal with, you know, once the changes, once you've overcome that readjustment, then life goes back to normal again. Yeah. <laughs> Pamela, you're putting your hand. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> about this middle age spread. Yeah. So what happens is, so as, as women, as women, uh, <laughs> Transition into menopause, so yes. estrogen and maybe testosterone is dropping as well. Mm -hmm. So yes, the other hormone we need to talk about is cortisol and insulin. So those mm -hmm. two hormones become more pub problematic mm -hmm. as women in perimenopause and when they hit postmenopause. Mm -hmm. Those two hormones together will fix fat around the middle. That's what they're fat promoting hormones. Yeah. And so what we can do through nutrition Oh. is actually add fat promoting or fat um burning food, yeah. fat burning food to help reduce those insulin and cortisol so women don't put weight on it's very very possible to do that and so that means not um skipping meals there's some great um research around fasting you know fasting for 16 hours throughout the mm. day you know mm. maybe have your breakfast at eight o'clock and you finish eating eight o'clock at night and not snacking in between because each time you snack your insulin level rises so having three set meals a day and moving away from those white foods so like white bread white pasta even even rice uh, white or brown rice just moving away from the having less of those foods and mm. moving away from the fruits that are really high in sugar like banana for example and having more berries all of those things help to spike your blood sugar more and having good quality protein so it is possible to maintain a healthy weight in a perimenopause and menopause. <laughs> the middle leg spread doesn't have to happen if you know what you're doing. Also, okay. you know, exercising, <laughs> I like that. exercising okay. and building yeah. muscles. Strong yeah. muscles mean strong yeah. bones. And so a lot of women in this phase of life feel as if they can't exercise or maybe there's you know the body image problems going on which call body confidence going on because they are gaining weight but they do need to keep moving because mother nature is saying your time's over you need to rest it down that's what mother nature's doing but we if we want to be strong vibrant physically and mentally we have to keep moving yeah good Doc, yeah, you mentioned the osteo, yeah, man, things like osteoporosis and yes. women becoming more prone to fractures, oh. um, 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 you know, during this time. Do you recommend any kind of uh, like vitamin D, for example? Yeah, How a lot of people are actually vitamin D deficient uh, by default because yeah. uh, if you, especially for surprisingly again, black skin because we yeah. can't trap the we can't trap the the sun here yeah, as much yeah. as it is. Mm -hmm. A lot of um, I quite uh, share sentiment with Pamela on the issue of diet and food and all those things. Mind you, a lot of these disease, I mean, a lot of these diseases around age of forty. Let's forget about almost now. Yeah, diabetes sets in around that age. Cholesterol, high cholesterol testing around the age of 40. So mm -hmm. a lot of things are compounding itself. So yeah. living a good life from around, a majority of us would have, uh, as they used to say in those days, I find it's funny because they used to say life begins at 40 mm -hmm. because you've established in your work, you have a lot of loose cash to play around with. Children are already in secondary school or whatever is going on in those days. So invariably is a time to actually become uh, more you think you have time to enjoy yourself so which unfortunately the, your body is not ready to take all the insult you want to bring into it um uh, vitamin d supplements does help exercise is a very good thing i must confess I, I i always feel exercising helps 
endorphins and then uh, making you, you know, you mix with people. It brightens your mood. It strengthens your bone. It helps with the heart as well. It reduces cholesterol by default. So all these things matter a lot. Diet, diet is very important. Don't um, overindulge, which is very fine. Okay. But um, at the same time, a lot of the uh, the bone protection, uh, hormones help with bone protection. There's no doubt about it. HRT is actually one of the main reasons why people use it. If you've got a strong family history of um, uh, brittle bone disease, then HRT may be worthwhile to actually use because estrogen is bone protected. I mean, protect, bone protective. So, mm -hmm. and it's quite useful for women to do that. Of course, getting involved in exercise and other things will help and strengthen the bones. Um, I think nowadays there's uh, most of the, you have the vitamin supplements for the over 50s, which yeah. tend to be a bit more balancing than when you just use o o any over the counter um, uh, supplements. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. I just say, um, so regarding brittle bones and osteoporinia, mm. that is happens before you get osteoporosis, mm. and a lot of people don't know they may have it but um as black people our bone density is is higher Stronger, anyway. yeah. yeah and um, other factors that cause can contribute to brittle bones as well not just estrogen with withdrawal mm -hmm. obviously you know muscle if muscle mass if you have muscle density then you have stronger bones but there's also like certain medications and um, and sweeteners as well actually weaken bone muscle but so we, we can bone so sweeteners so if you're having you know those low calorie drinks then that's going to, going to contribute to it stress long-term stress and coffee as well so it's advisable not to have coffee on an empty stomach because it actually helps to weaken your bones yeah. thank you thank you very much i just want to say hi to those online shika pamela thanks for joining um, Elaine Aubrey, Zetlin Smith, Faley, welcome. So, um, Faley is asked, um, saying that CBD oils and magnets also help with menopause. Now, that's yeah. something else we need to explore <laughs> further <laughs> in the next session as well. But do you know anything about these, um, Pam? So, CBD oil, so, um, cannabis oil, which is hemp mm -hmm. oil, um, acts on the cannabinoid system and the cannabinoid system in the body is kind of everywhere so it's kind of it's one of the things that helps so many different things and it's wherever you need that help so it can help reducing mm -hmm. um anxiety and depression it can help with the endocrine system so definitely help with hormone imbalances and it can help people sleep better so CBD oil as long as you have a good quality I wouldn't recommend you buying it from Holland and Barrett because you don't know how long it's been on the shelves for you want to have a good supply um, of your CBD oil definitely and make sure it's not covered in lots of pesticides and chemicals magnets I'm I don't I don't know it's not it's something that I don't recommend for my clients it's for me it I mean, I know it's worked for this lady in question, but for me, it's not really getting to the root cause of why she's having those symptoms. If it's if it's um, hot flushes, mm -hmm. then there's so much you can do with nutrition. And we know that hot flushes now is linked to, or severe hot flushes, is linked to cardiovascular health as well. So if that's what's going on, we need to find out how severe and what's going on there. Why is she at greater risk? Is there a family history going on there or is it that she's got nutrient deficiencies? Thank you. Um, Doc, yes. or, um, question. Up to, up to what age? Because um, you mentioned, I think you briefly touched on this, babies, um, women going, you know, say 40, you, in your 40s, you're, you're, you're nulliparous, don't have any children. Huh. Um, this is a concern for a lot of women. What is your take on, on at what age can a woman start or you know harvest their eggs? What's the latest age women can have? Let, I have to, <laughs> can have, what's the latest age? We know that between the 25 and 35, you're vibrant, but women who are nulliparous, 40 years old, getting in, you know, and approaching menopause. What, at what stage? Yes, the, the ovaries, the eggs, the, the count is down, it's very low, but at what mm. stage 
the okay. late age. We can say the that. okay if you there are the, the question is a bit it's quite loaded um <laughs> the if you before the age of 35 if you are thinking of say uh, um uh, keeping edge for storage for future best before 35 between 35 and 42 they will still use your one's eggs to actually do fertility treatment mm -hmm. um but there's something you can measure they call it amh which actually shows the follicular uh, level, I mean, the level of follicles, the number of follicles that women still have. Yeah. And some is quite different in, because it's actually ranked ag against age. The problem with uh, after 42 is mm -hmm. that even if you stimulate and you collect eggs, the quality of the eggs are not always good for artificial fertilization and mm -hmm. that people struggle with it. And what I always tell my patients is that if you are doing an operation for you, especially because of fibroids, I do get to see a lot of women in older women. Mm -hmm. I always tell them, either you go and do the egg harvest before the operation, and then we can do your operation, but always do something before 42. After 42, the amount of money that is spent on IVF is just not justify using one's eggs for IVF in the sense that the success rate is between one and 5%. Mm -hmm. It's not, but in such situation, then effort should be geared towards getting pregnant naturally. In which case, because natural selection, we make sure that only the good eggs get fertilized and then the pregnancy carries on. So what I always say is that if you are over 42, just keep on trying naturally. The moment you decide to do a assisted reproduction, be willing to use do not eggs. But before 42, fine they would probably try with the eggs but again it all is a bit individualized to be fair but general consensus is not to do stimulation over the age of 42. Mm -hmm. okay? okay i have an anonymous question here um does taking contraceptives pre-menopause um affect menopause in any way mm, no if you the, the because the problem with uh, follicles is not so much because you've used it alone. Yeah. It's because there's not, it's because it's aged, mm -hmm. okay? So invariably, whether you, because when you use combined oral contraceptive pill, you actually preserve, you don't use your eggs at that time because most of them suppress ovulation. It doesn't lead to long-term, you know, early menopause or late menopause. Um, it's just to manage whatever you want to manage at that particular time. Um, so using the pill, but if women, if you, of course, there are criteria for using combined oral contraceptives after the age of 35, because it also has its own impact on the health. So in which case we don't advise if you're overweight, if you smoke and others to use combined oral contraceptive because of the increased risk of clot in the legs. Yeah. Um, there are other form of contraception like the mini pill that people can use over the age of 40. But this technically itself does not affect menopause because it doesn't have anything to do with the, what happens to the follicles. The follicles, whether you use it or you don't use it, we still get depleted as time goes on. Okay. So the, the contraceptive pill, the newest research about that is it actually binds up the sex hormone binding globulin. Mm -hmm. um, and so a lot of women can actually experience symptoms of that, you know, a couple of months after tech coming off the contraceptive pill. Um, and it, and I, don't, I don't understand. What, what they so experience I'm, menopausal symptoms or? Not, not postmenopausal symptoms, but. I mean, symptoms, um, okay. Yeah. just symptoms of actually coming off the pill at that particular phase in life. Um, and it also, we know now that actually the pill contributes to depression and anxiety as well, because it actually steals vitamin B as well. And we also know that it actually interferes with the gut health, the gut microbiome, which means that you're not going to be as sufficient as getting rid of that unwanted amount of estrogen that's in the gut, and also um, just reducing your ability to make neurotransmitters as well. So I personally wouldn't really recommend that unless she wants to use it as contraception, but if it's about managing symptoms, well, let's get to the root cause of what the symptoms are and what we can do to support that. 
No, I, oh no, you wouldn't use the pill for menopausal changes. Is that, uh, that's not the question. Uh, yeah, some doctors do, don't they? So no, uh, no, no, I don't think that. They I, do. Um, I wouldn't use combined pill for women over the age of 35. I've got most of the time. You tend to use, uh, there are so many other safer men, men, contraceptive methods for that age group. Uh, the pill, particularly estrogen, high estrogen bombardment, and then um, with most of the type of uh, progestogens we have nowadays, actually it's not really technically that safe for women over the age of 35. Um, but generally speaking, you there are so many forms of contraception if that is their desire rather than the combined oral contraceptive pill. What most people will advocate at that age, and it's because of the, what we call dysfunctional bleeding, is you can use progestogen only pill. The progestogen only pill helps with the thinning of the lining of the womb and helps with irregular bleeding that is quite common at this time of life. Mm -hmm. uh, most of the time over the age of 40, as they almost start waning, then you have irregular bleeding and then what, what we and you can't find any organic cause for it other than just hormonal imbalance and in that situation mini peel of marina coil is actually quite useful rather than any other thing from from a natural per perspective so mm. i can use a herb called vitex actually supports um it actually supports pregnenolone and pregnenolone helps to make progesterone so we can add that in helps mm. to balance estrogen and progesterone as well. And then we also add, you know, lots of vegetables in such as broccoli, um, cauliflower, cabbage, they all help to detoxify estrogen and help to create balance. So a woman str doesn't struggle with heavy bleeding, even with, whether it's fibroids or not, we can actually use food and herbs to manipulate that so that she doesn't have to go on the pill or she doesn't have to have the call if she doesn't want to. So it's like an, another solution. That's quite interesting. Yeah, that, yeah, I, I, I won't argue with that. A lot of my patients go and come back and <laughs> we, we go from that both sides of the fence. Um, um, my, uh, earth is a bit uh, also psychological as well and a lot of what i've learned I've, i mean i've learned a lot from what you discussed because a lot of my patients actually come on and off and discuss with um, uh, uh, people like you and they come back and then we have a chat i have i, have, I do send a lot of patients with fibroid and irregular bleeding mm -hmm. to go and have other alternative uh, because surgeries is not always the only answer and a lot of the time to be fair having time to talk to a woman actually does help mm. in solving a lot of problems because a lot of what we are confused about is just understanding and nature. So, and um, anything we can do to improve quality of life by communication, by discussion, by nutrition, I think it's always worth it other than medication at the end of the day. Yeah, I agree. Thank you. I just saw a question ask, uh, to ask which contraception is best in terms of having less hormones in the body? But I think you, you, you both addressed that. Um, uh, yes. Well, I think, they, as I said, it depends on what you are after because your own, the most contraceptives don't actually produce as much hormone as what natural body produces. Uh, mm. The combined oral contraceptive pill is the level of estrogen it's actually put into the system is not much more than your body produces on a monthly basis when you are younger. Um, the, because what happens is that estrogen level is rises high to push for ovulation. Then after ovulation level comes down, then it rises a little bit around day 21 again and then comes down. Progesterone level is actually very low and rises to the peak at around day 21 and then comes down and then the menstruation occurs. That is a cyclical motion that happens every for a woman who is actually having regular cycles. Um, uh, progesterone only pill is quite useful, but again, you, a lot of side effects of spotting. A lot of people don't like it. The marina coil, I think is a brilliant medication if it works for you, if for a person, because one, it stops the period from coming and actually thin out the lining of the womb and prevent development of endometrial pathology that can lead to cancer or something like that. So it's quite useful towards the end of a period, like from about 45. If it's something you can tolerate the first six weeks of irregular spotting, once it settles down, a lot of people actually feel much better because their period causes a lot, because period can be quite debilitating at that time. 
a lot of people actually become tired, they become anemic, and then they're not, they, they, it's part of what contributes to the general lassitudeness of uh, menopause around the, from that age. The, would, you the, 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 would you recommend the um, copper coil? Because that's a hormone free. Uh, I don't like copper, uh, copper coil, especially depending on the population you are dealing with. Mm -hmm. Copper coil is actually associated with a lot of every period. So a lot of the uh, population. Um, the advantage of the hormonal coil is that it serves two purposes. In fact, it's funny because marina coil was put in as a contraception, but we've used it more to manage menstrual problems than as a contraceptive, mm -hmm. because it actually helps a lot in managing menstrual problem. Mm. Okay. You mentioned um, some of the side effects of the, of the HRT dog, but yes. the, the coil, in terms of infection, what's the... the, the yeah. <laughs> That's a very interesting question. I, when I, I used to <laughs> see that a lot when I worked gynae, but yes. I used to see that a whole lot. Infection. Yes. In the past, we never used to use a coil for women who haven't had children because of risk of infection. Yeah. But again, yeah. mind you, sexually transmitted disease is not as common as it, we used to think. Majority of people actually are used a bit more protective now. Uh, the hormonal coil works in two ways. Yeah. One, if you put any, anything inside the lining of the womb, it's going to stop pregnancy coming. But the uh, progestogen coil actually reduces, uh, what it does is that it thickens the cervical mucus. Right. So the cervical mucus is thickened, it's like the mini pill. Mm -hmm. And with that thickening of cervical mucus, actually box coming from the vagina up into the stream is actually reduced. So compared to what it used to be before. So um, I haven't seen, but again, I mean, I'm not in the, Cold face of uh, uh, acute gynae anymore because the, you, most of the people that see the acute gynecology are the junior ones. But I, it's not as uh, we see occasionally still need to remove coil because of infection, but it's not as common as it used to be. Thank you. Um, I'm just I just want to read something. Pamela Pamela Stevenson. She she said black. I can't see this properly, but black cohash cohash yes. helps. Helps uh, helps some people in menopause. Um, avoid alcohol, certain spices. Eat green leafy vegetables. Daily. Yeah. yeah. So these are some of the things that she she is um, promoting and and says that. Yeah, and and every and every woman's different. You know, yeah. it really depends on every woman. Some people like black cayhash, and there's some good evidence-based research to say that it helps. I personally don't use it with my clients. Definitely we need to up leafy greens, particular types of greens. Um, we also need to have healthy fats as well. You know, a lot of women are on diets and that's not the way to lose weight. We actually need to eat good mm -hmm. quality fats, actually. And some of these are like the avocados, the nuts, the seeds. Yeah. Oily definitely. fish and so on. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Doc, you, you said, I, I want you to elaborate a little bit more on the relation or the link between um, breast cancer and, and some of the HRT. I think I read something some time back um, by the Journal of American, um, the American Medical Association. Medical Association, JAMA, yeah, yes, the One Million did, Women Study. Yes, they did some research, they published mm. a research um, in I think 2017, 18, it was way back when I read it. And um, this was even posted in the, in the local papers as well, that showed that women prior to a hysterectomy that is removing the womb uh -huh. um, and taking HRT they are much less likely to develop breast cancer okay and this information we had some you know information on this before this this yeah. recent um result was published can you just elaborate yes I will just take you back to my screen because I was trying to show that during the uh, when I uh, the one women when I study where is it again is that it just a minute please I have okay I want to go back to oh dear what did I do let me just get I think it just went to the first just a minute please yeah. um the women the on what happens is okay let's go for no that's the one i just want to 
yes. Okay, that's it. That's it. That's the slide. Okay. Yeah. The risk of breast cancer. Okay. So if you look at this uh, factor, that's how many women out of um, one thousand women who will develop breast cancer between the ages of fifty and fifty-nine. Right. That's twenty-three women. If a woman uses a charity, you increase that number by four. That's twenty-seven. Okay. If a woman actually had hysterectomy and used estrogen only, that actually number is actually reduced by four. Okay. That's eighteen. Okay. And if you drink alcohol, that increases the number again by five. Okay. And if your smokers increases the number by three. Okay. And overweight, obese, that increases the number by about at the same number, 15. So you look at the different factors because the way it was sensationalized in the press was makes it look as if the risk is actually more than the multiples of numbers. So what you're looking at is that 22 women will develop breast cancer, but if you use HRT, 26 women will develop breast cancer out of a thousand women. Mm -hmm. Now, if you go into statistics, because the 1 million women study, that will become significant, okay? But in the general population, and again, nowadays we're a bit clever, as I said before, we never used to know what are the triggers for breast cancer who is at risk other than some epidemiological association like a family, familiar history. But now you can do the BRCA gene, you can get a more didactic family uh, tree and then reduce those the risk, those who are women who are at risk. What I've always found, if you want to want to use HRT uh, and you have got a womb, uh, then it's best to actually use the uh, hormonal, uh, like uh, the hormonal coil, the levonorgestrel levon secreting coil, and then use estrogen because it bypasses the liver stage, that is the enterohepatic circulation. Because what happens is when you use uh, any, any tablet you take orally, it goes into your liver, it's re-metabolized, and then it's spread around the body. So if you are giving something that is actually, because the only reason we add progesterone to HRT is to protect the endometrium is to protect against breast um, endometrial cancer. On, pro, on, on uh, pro, uh, given um, estrogen alone to, the, to a woman without protecting the endometrium, we invariably mm. lead to endometrial cancer because it will lead to overgrowth of the lining of the womb. So if it's, for, it's for endometrial protection that we add progesterone to it. And mm. you can bypass the systemic effect of it by actually giving, um, by using the mirror, by the uh, hormone coil, yeah. uh, it's quite. Uh, the, then you can use your estrogen a little bit more freely. Nice. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for that. Big one. This paranoia. <laughs> painful, okay. painful force. Yes. From the medical perspective, and from your perspective, Pamela, what approach or what advice would you give to couples? who are, or, you know, or ladies who are experiencing this. Well, I'll say couples, because it, it affects both of them. What advice or counseling would you give to, to, to these couples in terms of managing or treating? Is that for Pam? Maybe Pamela should crack on that. I would say what I, what we usually do. I mean, Pamela, do you want oh, to take right. it first? Okay. Yeah, you take it first, Pamela. Okay. Um, I think it depends why what's going on I mean it could be like pelvic inflammation that's going on there and so again I'd be looking at gut health and you know that kind of thing liver health and detoxification and reducing inflammation in the body totally um so yeah that's what I would do um in terms of psychological then I'd be looking at stress management and finding out whether it's it's some root cause to that where where it's come from I mean I, I've never it's something I've never done personally never had a, a client present with those symptoms so yeah. that's as much as I would say about that okay. but ginger I definitely add in ginger and turmeric and all those anti-inflammatory foods in and pre and probiotic foods for sure okay yeah, for me, uh, vaginal dryness is what causes dyspareunia. Oh, is that what you meant? Uh, yes, that's okay. a vaginal uh, dryness. Okay. okay. <laughs> so well, the dry, yes, that was, uh, that, the vaginal dryness is part of the, uh, what really leads to dyspareunia. 
Uh, even because you have to remember the vagina skin is very thin once the woman goes into menopause. The other thing is that it can be quite uncomfortable because the glands, you, because the way nature works is so funny because estrogen actually works on the cervical mucus to secrete mm -hmm. some secretions. That secretions is very thin and like almost slimy. We used to call it spin bucket test in those days when you are trying to prevent women from getting pregnant. There's one of the little tests you can do, you know, if, if you, the Catholic is very well preached in the Catholic faith that you just check your cervical mucus. Mm -hmm. Now, what happens after menopause is that because the estrogen is not being secreted, so the, the, the cervix doesn't produce those uh, glands and the juice uh, anymore. So it's a bit dry. Now, the friction of the dryness with uh, the um, in, in a brittle skin of the vagina is what causes a lot of discomfort. And of course, the bladder is also very, very, the bladder responds to the estrogen as well. So the bladder becomes very irritable as well. So people want to go and pee like honeymoon cystitis. Um, so what you, what I tried, to, there are two ways about it. Local estrogen cream is very useful. If you people are actually, if you don't want to use HRT, even just using the local estrogen cream to lubricate and smoothen the vagina is always very helpful. Then don't be too shy. KY jelly is readily available over the counter in Tesco. Mm. It's always worthwhile <laughs> to use it. There's nothing wrong in using it because once you bypass the initial uh, fear of, uh, of uh, starting sex, because majority of the pain is actually at the beginning of sex then the psychology of sex takes over and then you carry on with your normal co um, co um, copulation. Mm -hmm. But there's nothing wrong. Um, people use the lubricant. Um, there are some um, uh, condoms that also has lubricants. They can use it. There are so many different types of lubricant. The water soluble, the not water soluble lubricants can be used. But all these are fairly acceptable at that time period of life and there's nothing wrong with it. Okay. Ah, yeah. so I, uh, yeah, so yeah. there's only one thing that I recommend, a natural cream, it's by Dr. Anne Kuyper. Okay. Um, and that's kind of a natural feminine cream that helps to reduce that yeah. irritation. Is that this Australian person? American. Yeah, that is, uh, because there was a lady who came to me who wanted, there was a drug on air, uh, which is something to do with a cream as well, I think. I, I think it's an Australian group as well. So there are quite a few things that are going on in here, but I, I, I just uh, lubricant and then KY, and then uh, if all those things don't work, Ovestin gel works very well. Uh, Dinostrogen gel, uh, um, gel actually works uh, very well as well for some people. Okay. Thank you so much. We, 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 we're gone 15 minutes over, but thank you so much. Very interesting, very, very interesting discussion. And I'll just, I'll just try and wrap up. Um, is there anything else, any, any, any last words, Pamela, you want to, anything in terms of, I know hot flash is a big one, it's a big one. And I think we'll get more into the, the naturopathic um, treatment of symptoms as it pertains to menopause in the next session on the 26th. But are there any, Last words, final words. Pamela? Yeah, I think, you know, we've talked a lot about osteoporosis and we talked a lot mm -hmm. about breast cancer. And I think there's one thing that we really need to talk about and that's cardiovascular disease yeah. because that's the biggest killer for women post-menopause. Women aren't dying generally of breast cancer. Yeah. A lot of women are surviving it, even mm -hmm. if they get it, but cardiovascular disease is a big thing. And the links between that and dementia and diabetes, you know, all of it post-menopause becomes a problem. And so for me, what I preach is around the perimenopausal years is a time to put some working and invest in your health, getting your weight down, focus on your gut health and liver health so that when you get to post-menopause, you know, you, you are in tip-top condition. Thank you. I know Dr. Dr. Abiodun did touch on um, estrogen as a, 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 a protective factor, yeah. quite yeah. a protective factor for women. And, the, you know, you have the risk of coronary heart 
disease increasing and lipid profiles. And I think on the, on the graph that you just showed, Doc, it showed about obesity being one obesity. of the main, yeah. yes, you know, for, for the risk of cancer to be increased in women. So I think, yeah. yes, Camille, I do agree. Focus on your health, obesity, keep your weight down. Yeah, There's find ways, find yeah. ways to, to keep your weight down, but not from a place of depletion. The slimming clubs, you know, that's about not eating certain foods. Don't eat this, don't eat that. No, eat all good food. No, no one's gonna put weight on eating a plate of vegetables. <laughs> <laughs> well, all I will say from my own side is that menopause is not a disease, it's just a period of life. It, you, you can manage it, you don't have to suffer in silence. There are called so many things you can do that uh, can help you. Medication is always there to help if you think that you can't cope, but explore other solutions because a lot of the time, you could, most people will get away with just being supportive care, which is essentially improving the quality of life um, in terms of other uh, ways of uh, living. I think it's a time to enjoy. It's a time you don't have fear. It's a time that you, are, you know that you are, a, you are a respect. You, you become a senior girl. I mean, I remember my mom where she became a senior girl and uh, the kind of values that she just become, suddenly she gets invited to almost every big uh, society meetings in our village. So I think it depends on the way you want to see yourself in the community. None of us will remain young forever, however we try. But yeah. so uh, we shouldn't allow the body image to defeat the purpose of living. And yeah. I think if however you are not sleeping well, you're not, um, you're having terrible mood swings, the relationship between you and your partner is not working well, then there are helps and then people should uh, and she should go for it. Either go through Pamela way or you come through my way. But yeah. both ways are welcome. <laughs> <laughs> are there are there any support groups out there or any anything around this Pamela? But I know just tell us a bit of what you do because you focus on this, don't you? So just tell us a bit about your company, what you do briefly, please. I do, I do focus on this. And so um, you know, I'm always trying I look at women individually, so there isn't a one size fits all. Yes. And whatever symptoms you're coming with, I'm always trying to find out why you have the symptoms. I know there's a hormonal change, but we always try to balance those using food, okay, and targeted supplements and also lifestyle. And you know, you're you're managing your stress and your thoughts. Um so one of the things I do is the testing that we talked about, the Dutch test, and I do another test called the organic acid test as well. That's up to 72 markers that looks at neurotransmitters, looks at vitamin, mineral deficiencies, a little bit about immune health as well, and a tiny bit about gut health. So that is one thing that I do. But then because I've been doing this for a while, if women don't want to go down the testing route, I can use my clinical experience particularly like things around periods, you know, heavy bleeding and fibroids. This is really easy to fix. It doesn't take much effort at all. <laughs> yeah, seriously, it really is. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Is that so dark? Uh, uh, well, I... <laughs> Not with <laughs> where is Pamela based? Is it, if you are based in in that mountain, I will be sending quite a few of mine yeah. to you. Okay. I'm, I'm in Los Angeles. You know, the <laughs> <laughs> I, actually, to be fair, it would be nice to explore the management in the community mm. and then this uh, in and then with what we do. But I know every period because women do come sometimes. I used to have this thing, and I've gone to see a dietitian, and they've changed my diet, and my periods have been better. But I guess a lot of this again is because life changes. Life. I think a lot of what we go through can be helped by just having a bit of adjustment to our lifestyle, and Absolutely. I think it works a lot well. Absolutely. I wouldn't. Uh, we shouldn't. Um, everything is not medical. Everything. So there's a lot of uh, collaboration that we should be exploring more in terms of how we work, okay? I, I agree absolutely, totally with that. It's not just one thing, it's mm. the combination of it all. And okay. sometimes women need HRT, sometimes women need, you know, surgery. Mm. As well. So, and it's yeah. about supporting women in yeah. those decisions as well. So yes, so I work with women one-to-one. -one, yeah. And I also work in a small group of women as well. So people can come and join my group. Okay. And uh, I have a Facebook group as well. 
Let's see. Oh, and what's the name of that? Pamela? So if you find my page, my page on Facebook is Pamela Windle, my full name, and then it's um, Hormone Happen. Oh my goodness me, I can't remember what it's called. <laughs> Let me just find it. Uh, it's on Instagram, I'm Pamela Windle and Hormone Coach. If anyone's on Instagram, oh yeah. So on Facebook and Pamela Window, Hormone and Health and Vitality. Um, so if you find that, you can find my page, my group as well. You can find my little private group as well. Thank you. Well, thank you both. We've come to the end of tonight's um, discussion. And I want to thank everybody who's been online, who's asked questions anonymously, openly, your comments. Thank you so much again for joining us. And Doc, thank you again. And I'm sure this is not our final meeting. All right. No. <laughs> Pamela, neither are you. No. All right. Thank you both so much for joining and sharing such, you know, gems, gems of information with us. Thank you so much. Very thank educative, you. very informative. Thanks a lot for joining us. And I want to encourage everybody, just have a positive mental attitude toward menopause. It's inevitable. It's going to happen. Um, it's how we approach it. And we don't have to approach it with fear and dread. It's not the end of life. It's not a disease. All right, you can live. Embrace it. Love yourselves and look out for yourselves. Protect yourselves. All right. Thank you so much again. And join us on November 26th for a continuation on the discussion on the topic of um, menopause from a natural, naturopathic perspective. All right. Thank you, Thank you so much. Good night. Thank you, Doc. Thanks, Pamela. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.